Okay, why don't we go ahead and start, get started here. Uh, I know some people are still trickling, but that's fine. So first, let me just mention, this is the first time I've spoken to you guys at this conference, so let me just mention it because I've had some people asking about it. The, um, so as many of you probably know, on the Contra Cruise, which was last week, I debated Tom Woods, and we had this sort of side agreement that the loser of that debate would shave his beard. <laughs> now, this, I did something with sort of a logic puzzle here. Because I shaved, does that mean I lost the debate? Not necessarily. Okay, now. <laughs> what you also would need to really cement it was to see Tom's face. And so I'll just leave that open to your imagination. Um, so for this talk today, let me mention on the plane back from Seattle, there was this guy sitting next to me. And, and I was working on this presentation. And so then, and I could, t it was a six hour flight. And I could tell at some point, you know, he was like working up the courage to ask me. And finally, he said, yeah, this, this presentation you're doing, the economics of the Green New Deal, if you want to like try it out on somebody, would you do it on me? <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I said, no. Um, <laughs> um, he's just like, I fail to see how that benefits me. Um, but I did tell him I was going to email him afterwards. So if, if at times it seems like I'm being very clear and not making inside jokes, that, that's why. Some of you may say, that was the clearest presentation Murphy's ever given, and that's partly probably why it's going to be that way. The other thing, though, he said that was intriguing is at the end, he said something like, a lot of us agree with you. And I, and I think, so I don't know, I mean, because I don't know how much he was seeing or whatever, but I, I think what he was saying is, yeah, we, we realize, because obviously, as you can guess, probably, I'm not going to be on board with this. It's not that AOC and I are uh, joined at the hip on this. And so I, I guess he was trying to let me know that, oh, yes, in liberal Seattle, a lot of people talk like this, but, you know, secretly, a lot of people agree with you. So, vive la resistance, my brother. <laughs> and I hope you're not watching this at work. Just, uh, if, if you are, just, just sit, blame it on me and say I misunderstood. Okay, so... Uh, the other sort of caveat I'll give here with this one is, I mean, it's appropriate, this is topical, and certainly I think most Austrian economists would be fine with the stuff I'm going to say here, but as you'll see as I go through this, I'm not going to make like methodological critiques or something and say, oh yes, they have their utility functions and, and their models, everything makes sense and we should have a Green New Deal, but we Austrians you know, know that value is subjective. That's not what I'm going to be doing. So that stuff's all true, of course, but... I think that concedes too much to the advocates of aggressive government intervention in the name of fighting climate change. So I am a, an economist at what's called the Institute for Energy Research, and that's where I'll, a lot of my work that you're going to see here, you know, that's, that's where I do it, and I'll, I'm just summarizing some of the key takeaway points. But in that capacity, I went into it, you know, thinking like, oh, gee, you know, we've been lectured to for years about how the consensus is out there and the science is settled and the only people who could possibly doubt the, uh, the need for aggressive government intervention are you know, people who don't understand science or um, hacks who are in the pay of big oil. And really, that's, that's not true. So as you'll see as I go through this, all you have to do is read the, the reports put out by like the UN or the Obama administration, and you'll see that the, the consensus science does not at all support the aggressive policy measures. All right? So don't misunderstand me. I'm not up here saying, oh, I don't believe in climate change. That's sort of a bait and switch in and of itself. They lead you to believe that you have to deny basic chemistry or physics in order to not have the conclusion pop out that you know the government needs to slap on a big carbon tax or people need to stop eating so much meat or people need to stop having so many kids or else we're all dead. That is just not at all supported, again, by the very documents that are being held up as the consensus science, all right? So if you want to see more on that general theme, a talk I gave at previous Mises U's, um, what's the plural of Mises U? Is it Mises U's? That sounds kind of funny, but in any event, um, the, the, the previous episodes of Mises U, um, talks I gave there about the Paris Climate Agreement. Okay, so you'll see more. If you, if you want to see more about in terms of just like the two degree Celsius target, is that really supported by the literature? And it turns out, no, it actually isn't. And yet that's just an article of faith. In fact, now the UN's telling people governments how to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, all right? So that's the spirit in which I'm gonna go through this is just to show you that this is, it's amazing to me. Like when you just delve into it a little bit, you don't even have to be a trained economist to read it. All you have to do is have the attention span to get past the summary for policymakers and get into the nuts and bolts of this stuff and understand the jargon. And you can see it does not at all support what like the media headlines are telling you. And I'm saying that, and it's not so much that I'm blaming the media because I can kind of see any individual 
sort of evolving in this milieu of, of the information, they would just naturally take it in stride. So it's, I don't know who's to blame for it, but the point is there is this chasm between what the science actually says, if you include with that the, you know, uh, like analysis of government policies, like how, sh how should people respond to this given these facts or, you know, these tendencies concerning natural science relationships. Okay, so uh, just for those who don't know the elements of the Green New Deal, which is the focus of today's talk. So Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, who uh, is a rising figure in U.S. politics, um, for those who are from other countries, I'm not sure how big a deal she has had on your news cycle, but here, so she was newly elected um, in the previous uh, midterm elections and is just having a lot of impact on the political discussion far out of proportion to what you would have normally thought. And one of her signature issues is the so-called Green New Deal. So she didn't invent that phrase. I, was, I looked at before the talk here. I think Thomas Friedman used it as early as 2007 or 2008. I'm not sure if he coined it, but so this idea has been going around. So obviously, what it's alluding to is the New Deal of the United States in the 1930s. So the Franklin Roosevelt's administrations, they were implementing what they called the New Deal. And it was a whole series of um, interventions, regulations in the market, but also involved a lot of big spending programs. And so in standard you know, US history that you would learn in, in grade school, especially if you went to a government school, it would be, you'd learn, oh yes, the US tried laissez-faire, there was the stock market crash in 29, Herbert Hoover was this you know, ideological do-nothing laissez-faire president, didn't do anything, the, we had the worst economy in US history, then thank goodness the American people came to their senses, elected FDR, he implemented the New Deal and that got us out of the depression. All right, so that's stuff you would, you would learn in a standard setting, which of course um, others and I at, at Mises U have, have shown that the, that history is wrong, both in terms of just the theory and, and the standard you know, historical figures. But that's the context for which AOC, so AOC stands for Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, is um, trying to link this new aggressive program to something that a lot of American progressives would have thought, ah, yes, that was back when we, we solved a problem back then that was huge. We now face a similar problem, the climate crisis, and they're, you know, so they're trying to link those two together. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the language involved here, so as we go through the talk, I'll give you more specifics about the things they want to do because I'll show you like the cost estimates. So rather than me spend too much time here summarizing it, I'll just give you a spirit of the flavor. So this is from the draft legislation that they released in December of 2018. And it was saying that they want to have this committee to establish a Green New Deal that would have authority to develop a detailed national industrial economic mobilization plan. Okay, so you can see that the part of what they're doing is they're saying we can't think small we have to be big and bold. That's successful you know, politically, like they're saying, hey, back during the New Deal, FDR didn't shy away from doing something radical. Even though people said he was a socialist, he went ahead and did what was necessary. And they're saying, you know, in our time now, the climate crisis is serious. We've, and th this is kind of like how Cortez um, uh, sort of pushes against some of the older people in the Democratic Party, including Nancy Pelosi. She's saying that, you know, we've, we've tried their, their compromise approach, their, their play nice politics, you know, they want to do a little carbon tech, and the time for that is, is beyond us, that, that we, re, we have, and she actually says, I'm not putting words in her mouth, she has said we have 12 years to act, and, you know, that's what, that's what the UN's telling us, we have 12 years to turn this around, or it's over, we, we missed the window, okay, and so we have to do big, bold programs, and on top of all that, they say this will address all these other social and economic problems with the United States, right? So th they have all sorts of stuff in, in this uh, document involving like gender imbalance and stuff like that, okay? So this is all, so you can see where they're coming from. They're saying we have this big, bold plan and they're saying not only do we need this in terms of the science, but it will sell politically, right? People get excited about some big, bold program like a Green New Deal, whereas something like, oh, let's have a carbon tax set to the social cost of carbon to deal with a negative externality, that puts people to sleep. They don't want that. And another thing, too, that they say, and she's probably right politically, is let's stress, you know, in, instead of um, having the, you know, the broccoli and the, and the vegetables, why don't we give them the good stuff, okay, that people like spending programs. They don't want to hear that you're putting in a tax that will make gasoline more expensive, and that's what a carbon tax does. So they, they don't really focus 
and the Green New Deal and that stuff. They sort of mention as an aside, oh yeah, sure, we'll tax stuff, don't worry. And, and you know, that's, I don't think there was any doubt of that. But their point is, no, what we're focusing on is like spending a, a trillion dollars plus on new infrastructure, like to refit buildings in the, in the United States with better insulation, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So that's um, where they're coming from. Yep, so they calls for spending at least a trillion dollars over 10 years. And, you know, they have different language, but the idea is they want to get the U.S. down to net zero emissions. And what's it, so that phrase net zero um, means like there's still going to be things that emit carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the U.S. 10 years from now or 12 years from now. But they're going to take other measures to compensate for that, like planting trees or, you know, doing other things that that suck carbon out. So they're saying on net. And this is where just to as an aside, if you've heard somebody on, a, on one of the FAQs that was up originally, so the frequently asked questions, one of the ones that they had, the hypothetical questioner who's reading you know, their version of the, the, the draft language for a hypothetical Green New Deal, they have people say, why are you going for net zero emissions as opposed to you know, just zero emissions, period? And that's where they said the infamous thing of, um, I'm paraphrasing here, but this, this language was in there saying something like, well, because we realize in a decade that's not enough time to completely get rid of airplanes and farting cows, all right? And so that's why a bunch of Republicans then, and people like Rush Limbaugh were going around saying AOC wants to ban hamburgers, <laughs> right? And then of course, people like Paul Krugman say, oh, that's a dirty, rotten lie. And to prove it was a lie, they're saying, that, that was put up for, that wasn't intended for public consumption. The, the public wasn't supposed to see that, and they took it right down once people started flipping out. Which, you know, you can imagine in, in other contexts, like if, you know, some Republicans had put up something saying we're trying to, well, we can't get rid of all abortions in 10 years, so that's what, I don't think Planned Parenthood would say, well, they took it down. They probably don't really have anything, you know, that's, okay, so again, this, that stuff was not a straw man. That was in the FAQ that somebody on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's staff, they posted publicly, and then when people started flipping out, that's when they, when they took it off, right? And there was other things, too, that I won't dwell on in the original version they put up about, like, people, it was, there was a line in there about how they're going to have a job guarantee for those unable or unwilling to work. And so some people were a bit concerned, what do you mean the unwilling to work? You're just, and, and so they took that down, and they go, oh, that's a dirty Republican lie, just because we put something up there, you're, you know, quoting us? Come on, is that what we come down to, quoting? All right. Okay, so here are some problems with, with the Green New Deal. Obviously, we, we could dwell on any one of these, but just to go through it quickly. So one thing, and again, and this just shows you how, uh, I don't know, like to use the, the language that the, the left often used, to, how in ba bad faith these arguments are, where you don't take them seriously. The word nuclear did not appear in the original draft legislation. And then later, because people were asking about it, they, were, they clarified and said, yes, we, we will not expand nuclear power at all. In this, all right. So again, if if you really thought that you know our grandchildren's fate depended on us drastically reducing carbon dioxide emissions within the next 10 to 15 years, then the only hope you would have of doing that would be to drastically expand electricity production from nuclear, right? Because that's zero emission. And yet they don't want to do that, and for obvious reasons, because nuclear power for a long time has been a boogeyman to people on the left. And so, you know, why, why would they expand it? What they want are so-called renewables, wind and solar are their, are their babies, okay? And in some settings, they also support hydro. And by the way, that's another example of this, just to show you why, you know, I don't believe the surface rhetoric that um, for pe there's things, these things called renewable portfolio standards for U.S. states where they're gonna generate a certain percentage of their electricity from so-called renewable sources, and in those states where hydro, you know, water or uh, electricity coming from water power actually makes economic sense, then hydro does not count towards fulfilling those requirements, right? There's, no, it's got to be wind or solar. And so it's, you know, really it comes down to it's not so much that they're, they want the utilities to demonstrate to them, no, we're, we're generating stuff from renewable power just like you want because, you know, hydro is renewable. It's that they have to do something that's uneconomic, right, to show that they're engaging in sacrifice. If it made economic sense for a particular region to have a lot of power from hydro, they don't get patted on the head, oh, okay, you're, not, you're part of the, the solution, that just doesn't count because, oh, well, you're just doing that because it's, it's the profit motive, all right? So again, that's, it's showing that this stuff is rolled up into the broader 
let's call it agenda or vision of a good society of a typical progressive leftist who's hostile towards capitalism and you see that um, just shining through with all this stuff. Okay, another problem with this, again, even if you were a Keynesian like Paul Krugman, we don't need a new deal right now. Okay, so even if you thought the original new deal did solve the problem of the Great Depression and got rid of double digit unemployment and so on and the infrastructure was a great way to create jobs, boost aggregate demand, even if you bought all of that hook, line and sinker, it still would not follow that right now we need a Green New Deal, right? Because according to any conventional measure, the labor market is certainly not in need of a massive fiscal stimulus right now, okay? And the Fed has been tightening, so the very least you'd say first, the Fed should cut interest rates back down to zero and only then would you consider, all right? So my point being, this doesn't even make sense even if you were a standard Keynesian, let alone if you're an Austrian. Okay, another problem with this stuff, again, just taking it prima facie face value here, even on its own terms, it has a laundry list of various goals and programs of you know, things they want to achieve with this Green New Deal, and they're internally inconsistent. And so one, just, just one example of what I mean here is that part of what they want to do is retrofit every building in the United States to make it you know, more energy efficient and so on. All right? and, and when I say every building, I'm not exaggerating. Like they really have language in there to suggest that they mean every building needs to be you know, considered for this and upgraded if necessary. The other, at the other uh, hand, another of their goals is to rapidly move toward, again, net zero emissions, at least from the electricity sector. Okay, and so if you think about it though, those two goals don't make sense. If you achieved the latter goal, right, if you got it so that the electricity used in the United States was derived from sources that didn't emit greenhouse gases, you know, to produce that electricity, then it doesn't matter whether your buildings are energy efficient or not, right? Because the whole the reason you want to have energy efficient buildings in this context is because then you don't need to use as much electricity, you know, for your heating or your air conditioning, depending on what season it is. And so then you don't need the coal fired or the natural gas fired power plant to produce as much electricity. Okay, but so you see the problem there that if, if they actually did achieve the one goal, then the other one is unnecessary. But just to even think like that is, is so alien to the, you know what I mean? That to, to think like that makes it sound like they actually have some specific thing they want to do and they're trying to use the best least cost means to achieve that. And that's not really what's going on here. I think that the, the list itself of things is its own goal. And that's why it's actually kind of naive and, and silly, missing the point to ask, well, wait a minute, will these things achieve this, this alleged climate goal that they want? That's not really the issue, all right? And this is just another example of that. Okay, so as I've been alluding to here, obviously when you read the whole list of things they wanna do here, this climate crisis is just a pretext for all sorts of things that people on the progressive left who are typically hostile towards capitalism have been clamoring for for decades. All right, it's again, they want things like the, the Green New Deal, among other things that it's gonna achieve that they talk about explicitly in the draft legislation and in the FAQs and so on in the discussion. It's not just about, oh, we're gonna solve the climate crisis and make sure that we restrict um, you know, atmospheric levels of CO2 to such and such targets. It's much more than that. It's things like restoring, um, gender parity in labor markets and making sure that we you know, don't discriminate against indigenous peoples and things like that, right? So it's all sorts of interesting language in there that again, sounds odd for a document that's talking about this alleged particular natural science crisis that you know, we have to do some quick technological fix for. To give an example of what I mean, so in this um, list of, of the attributes describing what they're gonna do in the Green New Deal. They have this um, one clause in there saying, for anything they're gonna propose, they're going to obtain the free, prior, and informed consent from indigenous peoples, okay? And so that sounds great, but again, the context is they're saying humanity is on the verge of it, an existential threat, and so my point was, why are we gonna let indigenous peoples ruin the planet? Right, I mean that's 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 what it comes down to. We're gonna say, they're gonna we're gonna let indigenous people hold the rest of humanity hostage. That's great. Or to flip it the other way, they certainly did not get the free, prior, and informed consent from shareholders of coal-fired power plants before ruining their way of life. Right. So again, and this and it's not even just a cutesy thing about well, okay, you know, uh, native peoples versus a big business. Even when it comes to other people living around the world. 
part of what they're doing in this thing to the extent they're going to have a carbon tax is they would have what's called border adjustments. And so the idea is if the U.S. taxes items here based on their carbon content, well, then there's a concern that if, some, like, if China doesn't follow suit and they're not taxing their stuff, well, then people could export stuff from China into the U.S. more cheaply because they're not getting dinged with a carbon tax. And so then at the border, we would compensate, right? So anything coming into the U.S. from a country that doesn't have a carbon tax or doesn't have high enough of a carbon tax, the U.S. would put in a, like a, a quasi-tariff to, to account for that. Okay, so again, it's, you know, just think that through. So they're going to they're gonna use coercion to influence what other people do in terms of their government policies, right? Because obviously the whole point of that is to encourage other governments to likewise levy a carbon tax in their own jurisdictions and not think that they're going to be able to get an export advantage to the U.S. or Europe or wherever because they're not taxing carbon and doing the responsible thing. So again, using our you know, political system to lean on other peoples to get them to do what they want, right? So in other contexts, to interfere with other people's elections is a no-no, but it's okay you know, if the U.S. government influences other people's government policies because, oh, it's in the name of fighting climate change, right? So again, this stuff about obtaining free prior to informed consent, obviously the real thing there is typically someone on the progressive left is very concerned about indigenous peoples, whereas they don't care about big business or they don't necessarily care about the, the people in, in China and, and you know, what their government might be doing. Okay, so let me give you a cost estimate of some components of the Green New Deal. So this comes from the American Action Forum. And there's some no huge numbers here, admittedly, all right? So the, the bottom line here is a 10-year total cost of $93 trillion. And let me concede to you, when I first saw that, and, you know, and this thing was making the rounds, so like right-leaning think tanks and media organizations that, were, uh, that typically are against Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, obviously they pounced on this and they were distributing it and it was making the rounds. And I, when I first saw it, I thought, okay, I bet you they're stretching at points to come up with such a big number, because how could it be? And no, they're not, all right? That I, I re went through the thing, again, I was skeptical at first, and I went through it, and they explained you know, how they came up with these calculations, and it is very conservative. And I'll, I'll give you an example when I hit one of them as to you know, some of the assumptions they made that would underplay what it is. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying if some version of the Green New Deal passed it would actually mean, in fact, there'd be a 10-year cost of $93 trillion because that's crazy. They wouldn't do something so ludicrously expensive. What it means is the actual language so far of the Green New Deal is just crazy. I mean, they might as well just say, we're going to give everyone a unicorn, <laughs> right? And then some, you know, some horse society, would, equestrian society would come along and come up with an estimate of infinity. And we'd say, okay, that's, it's not that it's really going to be infinitely costly. It's that they're not going to give everybody a unicorn. That's what's going to happen in practice. Okay, so likewise with this stuff, the U.S. is not going to go to net zero emissions in 10 years. That's just not going to happen, no matter what anybody does. Okay, and so it's, it's things like that. So the, the, what I'm just kind of showing you here, I'm not predicting this is how much it will cost if some version passes. I'm just saying if you actually took them seriously and went through and started quantifying what some of this would mean in practice, the numbers just blow up really fast. So again, underlying how, how crazy and pie in the sky this stuff is. Okay, so... One thing is a low carbon electricity grid, 5.4 trillion, great. Net zero emissions, again, so this stuff, it's not worth getting into the mechanics here in this talk. You can you know, go Google that American Action Forum's estimate if you want to see how they came up with it. But let me draw your attention to, you see where some of these big numbers come from, is like the job guarantee. So that's the third one down, this one right here. So that's kind of a wide margin, isn't it? 6.8 trillion to 44.6 trillion. So the reason it's such a wide um, range there for the cost estimate is because they're, they're just showing under different assumptions as to what exactly are we going to do here when you say a job guarantee. Because part of the issue is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other proponents of the Green New Deal were uh, rather vague about the specifics. And so to come up with some of these numbers, they, the, you know, the authors of this cost estimate kind of just had to say, well, maybe they mean this, in which case, da, 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 you know, that's the way it went. And again, they were not reaching and putting words in their mouth. They were just taking the plain language and then trying to show in practice what would this mean. So for this job guarantee, where they came up with it is they said, all right, I think it was you know, something like six, $600 a week, something like that. So it was, it was a reasonable um, figure to, to show, you know, what 
what would be a job guarantee would mean. So they were you know, going to other proponents of a job guarantee to come up with some of these numbers. And then they were saying, okay, if we look at like right now at the unemployment rate for people who are um, underemployed for economic reasons, right? So not necessarily someone who's literally unemployed, but someone who's not working a full-time job because of economic reasons. So that's a specific classification. Um, and they said oh, all those people presumably would want to take the, you know, the government guaranteed job, which pays more you know, in terms of how much you get from a 40-hour work week. And so that, they multiply those numbers there. So they figure out how many people in America right now would clearly prefer to get the job guarantee versus what they're doing right now. And they came up with that. And it was that, that's on the lower end. But then they started saying, OK, well, also, what if there's people who are working full time, but they're in a job that pays less than you know, what the federal job guarantee would be? Presumably, they would all switch over. right? So that's, that's how they got the number bigger. And then they went even further and said, OK, what if there's people who are working you know, at a miserable job for 40 hours a week, and technically they're making a little bit more in take home pay than they would get from the job guarantee. But the thing with the job guarantee is you don't have to work. And so presumably a lot of people, even who right now are making a little bit more, would rather get the job guarantee and not work at all rather than you know, having this thing, right? So they, they started just going through and running the numbers to try to see how much this job guarantee would cost. And that's what gave you the wide spectrum there. And so, and I think, so they just, they weren't making any assumptions beyond that, right? So otherwise it was just simple arithmetic. And the reason it blows up so fast is just because, well, the job guarantee is a, a big number. In order for it to truly be able to replace a job, it's gotta be a decent number. And then times however many million people you, you, know, you have doing it over the course of 10 years, that's what, where they come up with these numbers. Beyond that though, it's also, I think they're understating it because they weren't doing a feedback effect, right? They weren't saying as we expand and more and more of the population just stops working and now gets this job guarantee. And so now they effectively have the purchasing powers if they have a full-time job. Well, clearly over time, something has to give, right? So if you all of a sudden say 20 million people who right now aren't working or are working very little are gonna now have the income equivalent as if they have a full-time good paying job and they start going and buying stuff with it, Okay, so unless you're a Keynesian who thinks that we had, you know, artificially um, high unemployment, but for anyone else, whether you're a classical economist or an Austrian, obviously if a huge portion of the population now is consuming that wasn't before, and you haven't made society more productive just by giving these people purchasing power, that means the amount available for everybody else has to go down, all right, just in terms of simple arithmetic. So... If you think it through, no matter how they finance it, whether they run the printing press or borrow money or tax, clearly per capita, you know, your, your real after tax plus taking into account inflation wage rate has to go down if you're one of the you know, shrinking number of people who are still working in conventional jobs after they put this into effect. And so if the government's given this guarantee for anybody, whether you work or not, and now the amount you get, all things considered from your you know, regular job, keeps getting worse, even more people were going to switch over, okay? And so that's something that they didn't model that in here. They were just, they were assuming that everybody else's job would stay the same. Okay, again, universal health care, 36 trillion, that's not an unreasonable estimate. Even proponents of universal health care, you know, come up with numbers like that and the question is, how can we pay for it? And they talk about different things. So again, these numbers are not pie in the sky whatsoever. They, they, they walk through and show you how they came up with it. And this is just a few of the things that are in the Green New Deal. Okay, so what about this issue of do we really have 12 years to solve climate change? And I should say Ocasio-Cortez herself kind of admitted that she was just bluffing on that. Okay, I don't, ha I don't have the tweet. I didn't have it in here. But later she said something um, along the lines of, oh, and you know, people who who when take you know, the rhetoric about 12 years left literally at face value, you know, they really, um, they need a lobotomy. Or she said something like that, or their brain, she said some, some put down, it might not have been that exact one, sort of like you know, rolling her eyes, oh, and these GOP people, when I said we had 12 years left to act and that's what the UN told us, they actually thought I meant that literally, you know, go figure. And so <laughs> I, I promise I'm not, she, that's the way she played it when people were like going to the UN documents, it's like, no, actually it doesn't say that. And then she was acting like, oh, come on, you thought I was serious? So, 
Um, and again, you can go see her, you know, she's talking with, you know, sincerity and earnestness in front of this live audience where she originally said this thing about 12 years left. Okay, but for those who just want to see it definitively, let me show you that, how, again, this isn't even close. So this is coming from um, the UN's own documents, right? So it takes a while to learn how to read this stuff. But once you do, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And so where I got this from was the, uh, it's called the AR5. Uh, that's the most recent of these periodic updates that the UN publishes, summarizing the state of both the natural science, but also things talking about what they call mitigation factors, right? So different policies the government could do to help mitigate the impact of climate change, things that slow the rate of emissions relative to what otherwise would happen, and so that slows harmful climate change, and, and that's, that's the idea. So this is from their own document. Let me just, there's a lot going on here. What it's talking about, what's, what is this? It's the increase in the mid and long-term mitigation cost due to delayed additional mitigation up to 2030. Okay, so what this chart is showing you is to say, what if governments around the world did nothing until the year 2030, and then they began aggressively putting in place measures to try to hit various types of climate change targets? Okay, so that's what this is talking about. And what I just want to show you is the biggest number in the whole chart, the whole table, is this 44%. And that's showing between the years 2030 to 2050, if governments around the world did nothing until 2030 and only then began you know, their aggressive measures, the cost of achieving, and these are the targets over here, you know, so the, the particulars don't matter so much, I just want to show you the big picture. They're saying, oh, it'd be 44% more expensive to achieve those various climate change goals if we, if we procrastinate, if we don't do anything until 2030. And then in the long run from 2050 to 2100, that worst case number drops to 37%. Because th these ones, this top row, those are more aggressive climate change measures. The, the bottom row, it's less aggressive. So the more stringent the climate target that we want to have, like how much warming or how much atmospheric concentration of CO2 by the year 2100 is the goal, the, the costlier it is if we twiddle our thumbs until the year 2030. That's what they're trying to present here. But notice there's not infinity signs, or there's not an asterisk that you go read and says, we're all dead, so it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? So, and also the rhetorical point of this table, these people, you know, they're, they're for a carbon tax. They're for these so-called mitigation measures. They are trying to use this to show the reader Let's not listen to those counseling delay or those saying, let's wait for more data to come in because we, you know, we have uncertainty. They're saying we need to act now because look at, if we don't act, for example, if we wait until 2030, it's going to cost 44% more. Okay, but you, you see the, the problem is they painted themselves into a corner rhetorically because they've got other people saying if we don't act, so notice 2018 to 2030 is 12 years, the way that works out. You've got other people like Ocasio-Cortez saying, oh, the UN's telling us we're all dead or our grandchildren are doomed if we don't act, if we don't solve this problem by 2030. And here they're just showing you if we did nothing and just got started on solving it in the year 2030, oh, it would cost 44% more. And you might say, okay, but you know, is, the, is the original co baseline cost some huge thing? And then, well, again, the, the proponents of this painted themselves into a corner that Paul Krugman, for example, his said repeatedly in his columns that the cost of achieving all of these renewable goals and so forth is relatively low because hey wind and solar they just keep getting more and more efficient all the time pretty soon that you know even without government measures they're going to break even with uh, conventional technologies and so it's going to be in, in, in some of his columns he goes so far as to say the cost might be negative by which he's saying it actually would benefit us from doing it and that sort of makes you wonder well then why does the government need to force it but again that's his own terminology so it's the cost, if we act now, of dealing with hitting all these things and saving the planet is close to zero or possibly negative, and if we wait thir until 2030, oh, it's going to be 44% more. So I don't know what 44% more of basically nothing is, but it's not, we're all dead. Okay, so again, you see what I'm saying, that the rhetoric here is, is completely out of bounds, and you see how they've painted themselves into a corner, where on the one hand, they want to scare everyone and say, we need to act and take all these aggressive measures right away or our grandchildren are doomed, and then some people say, okay, but you're talking about revamping society. That sounds like it's going to be expensive. They say, no, 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 don't worry, it won't be. Okay, and so it's, it's kind of hard to have it both ways. If it's going to be relatively painless because wind and solar are going to be so efficient, 
just around the corner that it's you know not going to be that hard to switch over, well, then the market would switch over anyway. All right? Historically, people switched away from you know, horse and buggy to the automobile, and it wasn't because there was a manure tax. Right? People just naturally switched over. So if it is the case that it makes sense to, be, to drive electric cars, they'll do that automatically. Right? You don't need the government to have a huge carbon tax to force people to do it, unless it really doesn't make economic sense. Okay, in which case it will be painful to switch over. So again, they're trying to have it both ways, or at least a lot of them in this debate are doing that. Okay, uh, there's a few other fun things here. So how do progressives claim that a Green New Deal will make us happier? So I like this because occasionally, you know, the, the mask slips or, or some of them don't realize what arguments other people on their side of the debate are, are making to the public. Because what, so I liked this one, this article in The Intercept, it says, the, the one I highlighted here, it says, Fremst and Paul find that people who work less also emit less carbon dioxide. <laughs> and, the, and the punchline here isn't novel. This economist so-and-so drawing connection between work hours and climate change for well over a decade, da 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 da, da. How Americans have come to work more and what effect it has on how people spend their dwindling leisure time. Okay, so in case you don't get it, the, the big picture here is the, re, the way the Green New Deal will make us happier is because it's going to reduce economic growth, people aren't going to work as much in the new equilibrium once all these you know, policies are in place. People are going to go to work less, they're going to refrain from working so much, businesses won't produce as much stuff, real GDP will be lower than it otherwise would have been, and we'll be happier because we'll have less consumerism. Okay, And so I, I, that may, you know, you can, you can make that argument, but I, I do appreciate the honesty of it. Right, So it's kind of like, if, for those familiar with it, originally the socialists said, oh, let's have socialism will produce more for the masses than capitalism will. And then people saw what a disaster socialist countries were and how people were starving. And then the claim was, let's adopt socialism because we won't have crass consumerism the way those capitalists do, right? <laughs> and so that's what they're doing here, that they're sort of admitting, okay, yes, output will be lower conventionally measured, but we'll be happier. Incidentally, I'm, I'm fine with that. Like if somebody wants to say, you know what, US culture stresses consumerism too much and if everybody worked 10% less and, you know, and, and didn't buy so much stuff and had smaller houses, they'd be happier. I'm certainly open to that argument, and that's fine, but you don't achieve that by forcing it on them, right? What you would do is you would voluntarily persuade them, don't work as much, okay? You, you wouldn't make them better off. Um, it's like if you, if you took away all the forklifts, you know, that, that would reduce output, but that wouldn't therefore make us happier. Right, even if it were true that we're working too much right now, and you know, all things considered in a paternalistic sense. <laughs> okay, what is the best evidence I can give you? So again, what I'm sitting here telling you is, it's not merely the Austrians and other radical free market economists who know that the claims made in support of the Green New Deal can't be right. It's conventional economics that's saying this. The, the best example I have of this, by the way, let me say this before I forget, is William Nordhaus, back in the fall, won the Nobel Prize, he was a co-winner of the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work on the economics of climate change. The same weekend that that announcement came out, the UN issued a special report advising governments on how to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Some newspaper stories, like in the New York Times, talked about both things in the same article saying, ah, William Nordhaus wins the, you know, his work for his work on climate change, raising awareness, da, da, da. At the same time, the UN, you know, showing the, the urgency of the situation, you would have no idea that William Nordhaus's work shows that trying to achieve a 1.5C target would be disastrous and would be worse than doing nothing, okay? And yet, that's the situation. The guy who wins the Nobel Prize for his work on climate change, his own work shows the UN target's crazy, is, is, is nuts, and it would be better just to have unrestricted climate change than to do that, such a crazy target. And yet, it's the same time that you know, his, his, article, his work, his, his Nobel Prize gets covered in the same story, and nobody in the media even knows to, to ask that. So again, it's, I'm not mad at them. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think they just don't know. And the, one, and the one time where he did have a chance to clarify, and I really think less of him because of this, because up to that point, I just thought, okay, well, you know, he doesn't want to rock the boat or something, but technically he's not saying anything wrong. He could say, hey, my work speaks for itself. But somebody um, for the New York Times, I think it was Coral Davenport, when she was interviewing him the week after he won and talking about, and one of the questions near the end of the interview was, do we still have time to hit the 1.5C target? 
And Nordhaus just said, no, I don't, think we, I don't think we have time left to do that. I think, I think that's unrealistic. I think we're going to hit that. And that's how he stopped. He didn't say, and thank God, right? So he didn't let anybody know that that would be a terrible target, or that is a terrible target. We shouldn't be trying to hit it. So I just, again, showing you the dichotomy of this. So here, in case you're skeptical and think, come on, Bob, how, how can you be you know, saying this? That's, we, we know how mainstream economics surely is supporting this stuff. This is the best evidence I, I've come up with thus far to show you that no standard economic theory, whether it's mainstream economics that you know, Paul Samuelson and William Nordhaus would endorse, or even Paul Krugman in terms of the, sta the, the standard models that he would believe in, stuff the Obama administration puts out, does not support the Green New Deal. I don't know if you can read that in the back, but this is an editorial from The Guardian, and it says, the Guardian view on a Green New Deal, we need it now, and the subtitle was, policymakers ought not wait for economic theory to catch up with the environmental crisis. <laughs> All right, and so this, when I saw this, I wrote an article saying, economists need to stop being useful idiots for the green socialists. Okay, and so there I was alluding to, there's this, and there's controversy over whether this was actually a thing, but in U.S. right-wing circles for a while, you know, back in the, in the 50s and 60s, the, a useful idiot was somebody that was helping the Soviet Union achieve their agenda unwittingly, right? Like they didn't realize they were being used by the Soviets. So the idea was that the Soviets, you know, the, the commies referred to these people as useful idiots in the West, okay? And so I'm saying here, economists who are publishing their papers on carbon tax, and oh, if we use the revenue to do such and such and reduce corporate income tax, we could get a win-win at it, that they're being used by radical environmentalists. They don't care about what their economic theory says, right? So if they say, oh, yes, there's a mild market failure and we should have a, a modest carbon tax, it's not that the green socialists are going to say, oh, wait a minute, carbon tax is $30 a ton and that's it because we wouldn't want to you know, move away from the Pareto optimum. That, that's not what they're talking about. You know, if they think capitalism is evil for you know, hurting, oppressing women and indigenous people, they're not looking at you know, what Pagu said about fixing a market failure. All right, and so that, this is what I'm, I'm trying to show. And again, th so the, the people who know, who are more sophisticated, they can't stand the work of William Nordhaus because they recognize correctly that using regular economic theory, even with all the market failure stuff and saying, ah, oh, yes, people who drive don't take into account carbon dioxide emissions and how they're imposing cost, you, you can't get the radical prescription and agenda of what the Green New Deal is calling for. It doesn't make sense even on its own terms. And that's what you know, this, this article is uh, confirming. Okay, so let me now, I just got a minute and a half here left, let me just show you some of the ways that things are getting better, and even the UN's own documents show it. All right, so this is something coming from, again, the latest um, report from the UN on climate change issues. I know it's gonna be hard for you to see in the back here. What this is talking about is the number of undernourished children below age five in both 2000 and 2050. Okay, so the 2000's a real figure, the 2050 figure is obviously an estimate. And so, you can see they estimated that in the year 2000, there were about 148 million undernourished children age five or younger. In the year 2050, what if there's no climate change? That number is going to drop to 113 million, right? So a big reduction. But now what does the UN say in the year 2050? If there is climate change, 138.5 million. Okay, so yes, it's higher than the counterfactual where there's no climate change. So there's a sense in which climate change might cause there to be 20 million more undernourished children, and that's a bad thing, other things equal, obviously you don't want that, but it's still better than what it was in the year 2000. And this is, you can do this with just about every figure you know, in this debate, that what they're ultimately talking about, they're doing things like saying, oh, in the year 2100, under pretty pessimistic scenarios, meaning where humanity releases a lot of carbon dioxide, other greenhouse gases, and the Earth's climate system is particularly sensitive to those emissions in terms of how much warming that they, they will yield. And you get pessimistic on the damage estimates from, well, that much extra warming, how much damage will it cause humanity? Even so, it's like a real bad scenario. Oh, maybe GDP in the year 2010, or sorry, 2100 is 9% lower than it otherwise would be. So yeah, prima facie, a 9% hit to global GDP, that's humongous. But when you couch it in terms of what's going to be in the year 2100, what that really means is, oh, the standard of living that humanity would have achieved in the year 2100, which they're going to be, and so instead of being like four times richer than we are, they'll only be 3.8 times richer, right? Or I've seen other people do the calculations where 
without climate change, if that just weren't a thing, if the laws of physics were different or whatever, then the standard of living humanity would have in the year 2100, now because of climate change, shoot, they gotta wait to the year 2102 in order to get that level of per capita standard of living. You see what I'm saying? So and this is, uh, we, again, these are the conventional figures. This is, a, this is stipulating for the sake of argument all the standard relationships that are published in the UN documents. So I'm not up here denying climate change. I am denying the interpretation that's being given to the UN's own documents. Okay, let me just show you one last one here. So again, this is based on standard data. This is age standardized death rate by cause. And you can see it starts in 1990, right? So I'm not like showing since the time of Charles Dickens. I'm showing from 1990, look at how drastically death rates around the world, including from communicable diseases, have come down. This is when we've allegedly been hit with the ravages of climate change such that only, you know, um, people in the pay of big oil could possibly deny. And you can see these improvements. Okay, so again, this, th th this is kind of the, the standard response I would give to the extent that this is true and that there are going to be, you know, certain problems arising from it. And maybe there will be, you know, that's an empirical question. The way to deal with it is by having relatively unfettered capitalism. People create wealth and they deal with problems, and that's the way you would respond to this stuff. Okay, that's my time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>